people in the state health would have their listen if I say all these numbers. People here agree with me. Right there. Okay. Say that's what let's I talk at the break. Okay. Right. Yep. Thank you. I guess I didn't need to print on this. We got five acres over. Sure. They like a couple of my own. Yep. That's what all. That's all. Yeah. You would probably do it. Yeah, you're fine. Is that Allison? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our um, April 26th meeting of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Board. Uh, a, uh, not a long agenda tonight, but we have an interesting agenda, so uh, we look forward to getting to that. Uh, first things first, um, we will do introductions. And before we do that, I was just reminded by Allison that uh, as people speak tonight, speak clearly and Kind of as loudly as you can because we have two microphones and we have had some comment and feedback from people who were virtually attending the meetings that they have difficulty hearing us speak so um if you project toward the microphone as much as you should and for those people in the background that aren't speaking a lot of times any chatter gets picked up as well too so if we could um eliminate as much chatter as we could behind the speaker uh, i think that would be very helpful as well too <laughs> So why don't we start with introductions and we'll start with uh, Bancroft. Michael Bancroft, Orange County. Jay Sweeney, Franklin County. Brian Bailey, Washington County. Neil Hogan, Bennington County. Ben McCarthy, Grand County. Brad Furland, Caledonia County. Martin Van Buren, Rutland County. Michael Colson, Essex County. Nick Burnham, Windsor County. Paul Patterson, Addison County. And virtually we have um, David Dean, Wyndham County. Allison Frazier, Chittenden County. Okay, and um, microphone's off, Paul. Paul, are you with us? Uh, we're, we can't hear you. Muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay, Paul Noel, Orleans County. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, Commissioner, I will turn it over to you to uh, oh, he's not a member. Well, that's right. Um, Commissioner, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself Thanks. and the staff. Good evening, I'm here. Commissioner of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Number of staff here tonight. Start with um, Lieutenant Trevor Simonowski from uh, St. John's Group. Work around the room. Kelly Thomas, Health Division. Scott, Director of Wildlife. Nick Fortin, Deer and Moose Project Leader. Dave Sawsville, Program Manager. I, just so you know, I gave uh, Catherine an evening off. I told her if there were any legal questions that I would start acting like a lawyer. She actually thought second, uh, second time about not coming. But in all seriousness, if we have any serious legal questions, Okay, thank you. Um, okay, with that, uh, we will slide into the agenda. Um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the, min of the minutes from uh, the April 5th meeting. I would move to the acceptance. Yeah, a motion and a second. Some second. 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 Okay, any uh, comments? Um, on the minutes. Okay, seeing none, hearing none. All those in favor of accepting the minutes as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 I was not here um, for the majority of the meeting. Um, ayes have it. Thank you. Okay, our next section section is the public comments period, and um, this is a section where we provide two minutes to uh, individuals to speak, quite frankly, about anything. And I would ask anybody who does want to speak um, to, if you would, stand by the microphone. So again, so everybody could be heard 
and those attending virtually can hear it clearly. So, is there anybody from the public that wants to speak tonight other than the institution? You can cut it out, introduce yourself, and um, and we'll have a timekeeper who's let you know in two minutes. Or two. Microphones here. Cool. Good evening, Commissioner, members of the board, and members of the department. My name is Bob Galvin, and I live in Richmond. I attended the last Fish and Wildlife Board meeting last month and would like to know why the department rejected the Northeast Wolf Alliance and Vermont Coyote Coalition's petitions seeking a limited coyote hunting season with reporting. I left the meeting slightly confused as to what the next steps were in the process. In speaking with my colleagues, several of them are pretty discouraged as they expected their petitions that they spent a lot of time and effort writing would at least be addressed publicly by a department biologist. Some of my colleagues are going to the extent of no longer wishing to even work through fish and wildlife as evidenced by the fact that some of them are not here this evening. My hope is that wildlife advocates are given a fair shot and treated equitably in the future. I would also appreciate an update on whether or not we will hear more details about some of the more uh, details for the reasoning that were given by the department for rejecting several of the petitions at last month's board meeting. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and have a good night. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Sarah Gorslein. I'm here from uh, Grand Isle County. As many of you know, I also work for Project Coyote, which is a, a national uh, nonprofit science based uh, dedicated to uh, non lethal coexistence strategies with native predators on the landscape. I'm here today to speak uh, in support of Andy Phelan's petition before the board tonight um, related to the um, prohibition of killing of black bear mothers with cubs. Um, it's Pretty surprising that that's not already re a regulation on the books in Vermont. I think many Vermonters would be surprised and um, pretty disgusted to realize that. Um, I also wanted to advocate for this board extending the same uh, respect um, towards animals to the coyote population in Vermont. Um, there's currently no closed season on coyote hunting in Vermont, which means that coyotes can be indiscriminately killed, uh, mother coyotes, uh, during pupping season, which is in the spring uh, current. Um, so, and I also wanted to bring up an op-ed piece um, that was published in Vermont uh, Digger publication um, by fish and wildlife biologist uh, Bree Furphy, um, where she stated Vermont is at the cutting edge of fur bear conservation and also that trapping is a critical wildlife management tool. Um, I couldn't disagree more with those two statements. Um, especially given that this um, board uh, does not currently have a regulated coyote hunting season and that there's no uh, reporting currently required on coyotes and other canids killed in Vermont, um, which means that uh, we're not actually learning a lot about the coyotes and other canid populations in Vermont from hunters, including whether or not um, endangered gray wolves are being killed in Vermont, which is against the um, Endangered Species Protection Act. So um, I it's pretty appalling and sad that this board hasn't yet moved forward on a regular uh, regulated coyote hunting season. Thank you, Ali. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, is there anybody else in the room here that wants to speak? <laughs> okay. Uh, David Robillard. Joining us virtually. I am. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, the reason why I'm calling in is uh, I'm a citizen of Orleans County and a former uh, board member. Uh, I'm calling in asking the board to reinstate the APR in D1 and C. Um, the agreement that was set forth by the state was that at the 50 percent threshold of year and a half old buck take, the state would then reinstate the APR in the areas that were affected. Year one, all areas were benefiting from the APR uh, that we changed the rules. Year two, a lot of these areas exceeded that 50% threshold. The state asked that they were given another year, but they believe that the 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 the, um, the increase in hunting numbers from COVID uh, may have played a role. And I think you're going to see tonight that 
Um, that 50% threshold was exceeded once again and even higher in D1 and C. And uh, it may have been higher in the other zones. Um, I think you'll probably see that tonight in the, in the uh, presentation. And I believe also under the commissioner's rule that uh, this could probably be done uh, for fiscal year or for hunting year 2023. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, David. Brian, uh, you want to speak publicly? We can't hear you, Brian. I think you're muted. You're muted, Brian. Brian, we can't hear you. Unmute your microphone. I'm sorry about that. Sleep with the switch. Okay. My name is Brian O'Gorman. I'm a tree farmer from Bennington County, Reedsboro Falls. May I speak, please? Yes, sir. Two minutes. Yes, sir. I'd like to recommend that you dismiss any petition uh, about uh, killing black bear sows. Uh, what am I going to do when I'm out there? Before I release my arrow, I'm going to say, hey, stop, bear. Are you a sow? Do you have cubs? Or the same goes for unloading a firearm. It borders on insanity or absurdity, and it probably has a more uh, a more um, unsavory uh, goal to it, to ban black bear hunting at all. So uh, I asked the board to reject any kind of petition for that. Thank you for listening to me, sir. Any, any questions for me? No, I think we're all set, Brian. Thank you. Anyone else? I see one hand up, I think that was Brian. So I think that's it for public comments. Um, next on the agenda, we have Andrew Sellen, uh, who's presenting us a petition tonight. You should have all had a chance to read that in your packets uh, that you received last week. And the petition is the uh, taking of sounds and trucks. And, uh, so we're giving Andrew 10 minutes plus and minus to present this petition. And then we will take the opportunity to ask Andrew any questions that we might have. And then our next goal, our next will be to ask the department for their response to the petition. Then we can ask the department questions as well. And then we'll decide as a board what our next step is. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, thank you, board. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to, to present this tonight. I know I have limited time, so let me jump right in with the roadmap of where I'm going, what I'm going to cover in the 10 minutes, and I am available today, available tomorrow, or at any time thereafter to discuss this further. What I'd like to have is, is a dialogue. I've seen a lot of the you know, very tense back and forth with other people who have asked for things, and I'm looking to have a dialogue about this, and I think it's a considered petition uh, that we may be able to make some some progress with. So my name is Andy Phelan. I am in Washington County and I've spoken with Mr. Bailey before about this incident very briefly about it, but it is I'm, I'm not a member of any organization. I'm just an individual. And the the roadmap of what I'm going to do is tell you the petition I want, why it is I'm asking for it, what happened in brief terms, and then six reasons why I think it makes sense and it's something that the board would like to do or should should do. Uh, so let, let me get started with that. So um, something I ask of the board, if you have not already done it, or even if you had, is to read the petition. 16 pages long, an awful lot of research and discussion with a number of people went into it, including discussions with Andrew Timmons, who is the project director or game director in New Hampshire. I've spoken and read the books by Ben Killam, who has raised orphaned cubs and released them to the wild. And I've spoken with a number of other people, including the Vermont bear biologist, Jacqueline Camo, with Major, uh, the Major Fowler, as well as, as other folks. I am not against hunting. I'm not a hunter, but I'm not against humane and, and, and fair hunting. What happened here is not. And it's something that I think happens far more frequently than we will or can acknowledge, but it happened to have been caught on video so that we know that it happens. 
in October, an, an activated motion activated camera captured a mother bear with her two cubs coming out to feed under an apple tree in a field. They were there for a little while and then the mother noticed something and tried to take her cubs to safety, but it was too late. As she leaves the frame of the video, a hunter stalks in from the other side, aims and shoots. The cubs, unlike the, the cubs were right next to the mother when he did this. It wasn't an, a mistaken uh, thing. When, when I heard about this, that was part of the, the, the difficulty there. But what happened next was within two weeks, three weeks, another neighbor was walking in the woods and she found a dead cub by a stream very nearby, actually on my property. It had no indication of having been killed by a predator, but just that it had starved. She went back a few days later, it had been scabbard. She went back a few days later, nothing was left. I, she brought me there a month later when I learned about this and there was hair and tufts left. When I heard about this, I thought this has to be illegal and I researched Vermont law and it's not. Vermont law permits the killing, the deliberate killing of mother bears with cubs. So what I'm looking for here is for the sake of the cubs, and I'll explain why in a minute, that the board pass a regulation that bars the deliberate killing by hunters of sow bears with cubs. So <clears throat> let me give you six reasons why I, I ask for this. First, there is a problem here. We're dealing with what I think is a blind spot in the department, and I don't say that critically. I say that because I haven't read much that any people have really noticed this, but most of the killings of, of bears happen off in the woods that aren't witnessed. Well, this one was witnessed, and what are the odds of it being captured on video and of the cub being found dead a short time later? We delude ourselves if we think that this doesn't happen more than we would like it to happen. I looked at the Vermont statistics over the past uh, 2020. One in 2022, no, 2020 and 2021, an average of 407 sow bears were taken each hunting season. It is, with, with that number, it is impossible that a fair number of those did not include sows that had cubs. In fact, if we take a small percentage, like say 15%, that means that 60 sows had subs, 60 of the 407 had, had cubs. Conservative estimate of a litter with two bears each is we're talking about 120 cubs more or less. But let's not quibble about that. That's a, that's a large number. Let's not quibble about percentages, like a few more or a few less. Around 100 is a lot. But even if you don't consider it a lot, consider this. If we agree that killing mother bears dooms the, most cubs to die, then what is the harm of having a law that says you cannot kill the mother bear? Uh, that has cubs. And we're talking about the deliberate ones, not the accidental ones. But let me get into the six, the, um, uh, the, the second of the six reasons. The first is that there is a problem. This happens more often than we would like it to admit. We just don't see it. The second issue is that uh, killing sows with cubs really dooms most, most of the orphan cubs to die of exposure, of hunger, starvation, or the elements or a failure importantly to hibernate or from predation from other animals. Cubs are take a very long time to mature and get large enough to defend themselves. They need their mother there, not just for the protection, but to teach them the things that they need to know. So the third, the third point after what it dooms cubs to do, the third point is that to survive and become independent wild adults, which hunters should want, which all Vermonters should want, the cubs have to learn how to run the gauntlet of survival. That includes identifying what foods to eat, soft mast, hard mast, insects, occasionally carrion and, and, and meat. But it requires them to learn that. They learn that from their mother. They learn, have to learn where, when, and how to find that food, whether to dig for it, whether to forage for it, where they go for it, in different seasons of the year when different foods, soft and hard mast, are more or less available. They have to learn in periods of scarcity, in droughts, when the beech crop fails, when the acorn crop fails, where they go next to find the food. They have to learn how to avoid human food. Nuisance bears are dead bears because they have to be destroyed. You want them learning from their mother so that they don't have to, uh, so they don't, don't rely on garbage, on trash. They need to learn how to avoid cars, roads, navigate roads safely, navigate around residential areas to find natural sources of food. 
They need to learn how to build, hibernate, uh, find dens and make them safe so that they don't flood, so that they don't collapse. There are things that they cannot learn on their own. And so they need to be with their mother for the period of time that it takes to learn those. Nature has told us what that is. Ben Killen has indicated that bears have evolved over 500 million years and they've evolved to where they are today, which says that they need biologically 18 months to stay with themselves. Because during that time they get the protection and they get all the lessons they need to learn in order to survive. And I think it's undisputed that it's better for bear cubs to be raised by the wild parents than human rehabilitators as scarce as the latter, as the latter are. Let me address the, the broad survival notion. Those of you who have read the petition already understand that this is a notion that says that cubs as young as five to seven months can survive on their own without their mother. You'll read detail about this in my petition, particularly Appendix A. I went back to the original studies, the papers that said that, and I have to tell you that they do not support that conclusion. They, go, they date back to the 1950s, and it was pretty primitive research at the time. If you ask modern bear biologists, Ben Killam and others as well, about what we have learned of bears since then, you can't look at 15 days survival, 30 days survival, or of a, of a couple of months. You have to look at the overwintering period, because that is critical, and that's the hardest thing for cubs to do, to overwinter and come out in the spring when food is scarce and have enough to eat while still avoiding predators. So in nature, cubs stay with their, with their mothers through 18 months, and that's when they normally separate from them. Um, so the broad survival notion, you'll see more detail in my, in my petition about that. But importantly here is also that the regulation I'm asking for does not require the expenditure of any further department funds or the expenditure of resources, the scarce resources of your human capital. You will have a dramatic impact on cub survival and on a healthy bear population if you simply pass the regulation. That is because I think you will agree with me and we all trust that most hunters are law abiding. If you outlaw killing a sow deliberately with cubs, most hunters will not do that. And that's where you will see the greatest impact from passing this regulation because it won't require enforcement at all. Some might complain about this, uh, this regulation that it would cause an enforcement problem, but that's the tail and the dog and that expression about the tail wagging the dog. The dog here, the good dog, is the, the impact that this will have on survival of orphans by sparing the mothers if you outlaw killing sows with cubs. That's because a hunter with that sow in his sights or her sights will not pull the trigger. It's as simple as that. I think we all know that there are also bad actors out there and that it will happen that somebody will deliberately shoot a mother bear with cubs. This doesn't put any undue burden on your law enforcement. They will do what they've done in any number of cases, which is listen to the facts, apply their judgment and discretion and decide what to do with it. If the case doesn't support it, then an individual enforcement case is not brought. But the bulk of your impact is simply by passing the regulation. And I have to say, you know, when, when Moses went up on the mountain, he came back with 10 commandments. He didn't come back with 10 recommendations. The department has already tried the recommendations. And, and thank you for giving me some extra time, Mr. Perlman. It takes a little bit. I'm almost done. He came down with 10 commandments, Moses did, not 10 recommendations. The department tried recommendations. It did the right thing. It put in its hunting regulations and its hunting brochure last year that we recommend against killing a sow with cubs because the cubs depend on it. But that didn't have an impact on this hunter. And I'm sorry to say, I don't think it has an impact on some others. It's the law that's required. It has to be prohibited. And most of, your, most of the hunters in the state and from out of state will abide by that, by a law, but apparently not by a a recommendation. I'm near, I'm near closing now. The final point, the sixth, is this. When I learned about this, I wrote about it in Vermont Digger in a commentary. I wrote about it in the Valley Reporter. I posted it on Front Porch Forum because I was so troubled by what had happened. And I got dozens and dozens, probably close to 100 responses from people who were shocked by what happened, were shocked, as somebody noted, that it's not already prohibited. 
the interesting thing is I got to speak with a lot of hunters and I spoke with Mr. Bailey and I spoke with Major Fowler and I spoke with a farmer who raises corn, who occasionally has problems with bears and uses hounds to chase them off, but who will not, and the hunters without exception told me that neither they or any hunter they knew would have killed a mother sow knowing she had cubs. So I think that this petition is one that has universal support, broad support. And I have to throw in something that that Andrew Timmons mentioned to me when I sent him a copy of this petition. Many of you know who he is in, in, in New Hampshire. Sent him a copy of the petition. He said, you know, it would even help the image of hunting and of hunting as a management tool to, to, for the population, for the people, for other Vermonters to know that it's illegal to kill a mother bear with sows, uh, with cubs, and that we haven't continued to sanction it once we learn that there is this problem with it. And I also have to say, Maine has the same problem. I call it considered a problem. And New Hampshire has the same problem. They haven't outlawed the killing of sow bears. But I, I think it was 12 or 15 other states, 10 of which I cite in my petition. I researched the law. 10 other states, including Montana, Alaska, Idaho, Wisconsin, there are 10 of them I cite in my petition. They have outlawed the killing of black bear sows with cubs. So I'm, this is not a petition that's asking for something that's out there or something that's extreme. And I think would greatly assist the image of hunting in Vermont and hunting as a management practice for the board to seriously consider this term. So thank you for your time. Thank you for allowing me to go a little bit over. I am available to, to discuss this and to, to debate, go back and forth about issues, to consider other evidence that you find. But I've looked at a lot of books, papers about this, and I think it's a well-founded petition, and I hope that Jacqueline Como, your bear biologist, can address it. I know that Mr. Hammond already addressed it. He was the former bear biologist for Vermont in his Stratton Mountain study, and he, um, by coincidence, I think was the person who brought Ben Killam 30 years ago his first black bears, his first two orphan black bears. Since that time, Ben Killam and his organization, small organization, has repatriated, I call it, rewilded over 500 cubs. His website isn't even accurate because in this past year, he had 114, he told me last week. He spoke in the Mad River Valley and I went to his, to his talk. But he doesn't release them because he knows they won't survive. If there is a, a bear expert, there is no more uh, qualified one on the planet than Ben Killam, and I urge you all, and I can summarize for you all the books that he's written, the facts that he's written about the need for these cubs to have their mothers to learn how to survive and be good, free, independent bears who would also supplement the hunting, uh, the, the hunting breed, the hunting stock. So thank you. That was um, a very thoughtful presentation and a very, as you said, well put together presentation. And, uh, Petition as well too. So, I'm sure there's a few questions probably for uh, for Andrew, or there might be. I, I have one. I mean, there's there's a uh, comment that you used um, before you get into your six points, and I'd be curious to hear your definition of this as, as it presents to the petition. Um, you you use the, the term uh, deliberate versus accidental. Right. Define that and put some clarity around that. Yes, it is the killing of the mother of the sow, knowing that it has cubs. There has to be knowledge. I, I'm not trying to cover a mistaken one. I'm not even trying to cover a reckless one. But one of the parts of my petition I didn't speak about here, but I think that is critical, is that I ask for an education component to become part of it. And part of that is for the teaching of how to identify, how to pause before you shoot. You don't want hunters out there anyway seeing aiming, firing, and then looking about. You, you want a moment before when they see an animal and when they shoot it. And I have to say this about that point. I spoke with Andrew Timmons, former bear biologist, now the head game program at New Hampshire Fish and Wildlife. And he said, and I think I put this in the, pay, in the petition itself, that, and, and it answers, I think it was, I don't see the gentleman anymore who called it by telephone, but when cubs first come out of the den the current year cubs, first year, they're called cub of the year cubs, I think it's called, something like that. First year, I call them. When they come out of the den, they are still lactating, they're still suckling on the mother for several months. 
by the time hunting season comes along, they are off the milk and they are feeding independently. And so they are with the mother, close to the mother, almost all the time. And that's what Andrew Timmons, I'm not an expert, but I've read a lot about this. Andrew Timmons explained to me that he has a lot of cynicism or skepticism if someone says they didn't notice a cub, because very often, usually, the cubs, by the time you get to September, October, November hunting season, are with the sow. They're not up a tree. They're not stashed somewhere like they were when they were weeding. But to get back, Mr. Furlan, to your, your question, it's, it's the deliberate, the intentional killing of the cub. And part of the training, the education that we should be mandated to go with that is to, to pause and look, to understand the reason that you're pausing and looking, and don't shoot if you see a group of bears. And that's another point that the Vermont Department already has is in, in its hunting regs. It recommends not shooting a group of bears because a group of bears means that it's very likely a mother with the cubs. So the department has already struggled with this issue and has addressed it in part. Do you have any questions? I do. <clears throat> and actually, it's for the warden. It's here. With looking at this and, and the guy being on camera, was this investigated as a poaching incident or anything? This is the first I've heard of it. I'm not familiar with this. I, I, I can answer that. I, I, okay. I know who the hunter is, and nothing I've written has been intended to out the hunter in any way. What he did, he had a license, he was in season. I'm not, I asked whether he submitted the tooth and I believe he submitted the tooth for, he reported it to the game station locally. Uh, the, the only thing that, that I, I, I don't know too much about is he walked right on someone else's property. He wasn't there. He was picked up by the motion activated and he shot it on another woman's property. I don't think the properties were posted, at least not recently, but th those are the circumstances. What was so troubling about this was that what he did was legal, and I thought there could be no way it should that shouldn't be because it was so clear that the cubs were with the mother. They, when they left the frame of the camera, they were right next to her as he came in, aimed and shot. So, but but it wasn't illegal. I guess my question would be, and and, I, and again, I appreciate you not trying to out the hunter and all that, but there is rules about how close you can be to a house. Oh well, that that I didn't, I, I didn't, I don't know that. Curious on that. Yeah. So from from listening to your petition or reading your petition, listening to your presentation, you're not necessarily looking to stop hunters from killing cells. And, and if I, I, I briefly looked at some regulations in Western states and some that I've hunted in, and so I believe their regulations specifically say a sow accompanied by cubs that you can hard to miss. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Sweeney, I'm not proposing not killing sows. No, I, I don't no. know. No. I'm not a bear and, hunter. I don't know and, how I would identify a male or sow, boar or sow in the woods. But obviously, if you see a sow with cubs. Well, that's the way a biologist can help, including that bears traveling together at that time of year. That's very unusual because mating season is over, so male and female aren't traveling together. And so if there are groups of bears, forget the salmon stream with all the grizzlies mm -hmm. in it. If there are groups of bears or more than one, you have to think twice. That's part of the education that's needed because it may very well likely when you get to October, November, they're trying to fatten up to get into the day. And hunters who are hunting bear ought to know a smaller bear from a larger bear. I know that they can vary in size from less than 30 pounds to 100 pounds uh, when they're even before they enter the den for the first year. But also importantly, by the time you get to the second year, it's not an issue anymore. It's only the cub of the year that you're talking about. When they come out, they're born as chipmunk size. When they come out, they're like three quarters, five pounds, six pounds, 10 pounds, and then they get larger. Once they overwinter and, and fatten up in the spring and early summer of the following year, then they separate automatically from the mother. So when you get to the hunting season, the second go around, not going to be, uh, it's not an issue that you, you you shot us out with cubs because they will have separated by that. Yes, we listed like 10 states, but you didn't list like what their kill was in each one of them states, like for but females. Then, you didn't list how many males or females were killed in I, I, states. I, I did not. I would be interested in hearing, you know, knowing. But what, what do you mean? What, what, when how I, many females like Vermont said they get 400 females compared to 500 males? I'm how, sure. they, how was that in the other states? 
in terms of, I mean, Vermont also says that they report that it's pretty consistent that 40% of the of the bears harvested are female year in and year out. I am I suspect that all of these other states compile the same information and I I can help collect that if it if you think it would be useful. I would imagine that your bear biologist might have a database that tells that. I you know, Jacqueline Kamoa apparently is at a Wisconsin conference and she was going to be talking with other people about their bear their laws and, and that. So we we can get that information, I imagine. I've seen, you know, that information or just to compare the states. And, and any, you know. Robert? Yes, uh, yes, again, thank you for the time and effort you put into this. I have a couple of questions. So, I referred to this interview and stated that whether they are working or controlled groups with the cubs, that two thirds of the cubs are not seen again. So, that was. That would imply that there's a high mortality rate, regardless of whether they're working or controlled. There is going to be a high mortality rate among cubs generally, uh, even with even with mothers. Life is difficult out there. That's the gauntlet I was talking about early. Uh, but the problems with those, and we say page nine. So you mean in the in the appendix A? Where I talk about the studies from 1957. The petition end, ends at eight, and then Appendix A begins at one through five. Yeah. 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 So the hibernation period might be a little bit longer there than here, but I don't think the biology is any different there than it is here where the cubs stay with their mothers. But the problem, I, I talk in detail about the studies that they really didn't show what people are claiming that they show. That this broad survival notion is what how I've coined it, that they can survive at five or seven months. Those studies don't show that. In fact, I think of the, the Beecham study and the Erickson study combined, they had three out of 35 Roughly there, so so less than uh, less than ten percent, even overwintered. They didn't even study overwintering, which modern biologists Ben Killam and and other people who have written about it said you must study whether they can overwinter because that is a very difficult task. Surviving for thirty days or forty five days or or two months or three months, being able to find some food and having the luck to avoid a predator, that's easy. Relative, I couldn't do it, but that's easy. But to, to overwinter, to fatten up, to know how to hibernate, to come out of hibernation and get food without starving, that's the skill. Those are the skills that the bears learn at the time and that those studies didn't even consider. Yes. There's, there's no question that mothers are going to lose cubs. Sometimes mothers abandon cubs. Sometimes mothers lose cubs to other bears. Sometimes mothers starve or get hit by a car. Sometimes mothers can't get enough food and they die or their cubs die. I mean, they, there are all kinds of things that happen with, with the cubs. Thanks so much. I, I'm aware of that. I guess my question, my concern is that I'm not worried about the cubs being that something is happening that may not be happening. And, and I don't doubt of what there may be sometimes when this happens, but it's my my gut feeling is that it's so minimal. That I don't know that it, that these are rules that change. Yes, yeah. I, 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 I understand where, where you're coming from, but but let me answer that this way. Was it, was, can I just, was that a comment or a question? Just out of curiosity. That's really my comment. That's just yeah. a comment. Okay. I, I I, are there any right. other questions, though, before you answer that, that you have about the um, other issue? I, I have a response to that. If it helps uh, Mr. Patterson understand, if, if I can have
Oh. The, I, I've lost my, my train. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just stay at the okay. Okay. Anybody on the line have any questions uh, for Andrew? Not seeing any hands. Okay. I think we're all set. Thank you very much for the presentation. Welcome. Thank you. And again, I'm available to discuss this. It's for the consideration and you need that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you or your department like to respond yeah. to the petition? Do it so. Uh, we read this. <clears throat> We get distributed out. We had a number of discussions internally. So I have Mark to summarize the discussions of the department. Yeah, you know, I well, there's an awful lot we could go into as a discussion, I think, for hours and hours with, with the comments that Mr. Phelan just made there. Uh, my recommendation, I think, on behalf of the department. Um, is that you reject this petition, um, you know, for a lot of different reasons. And I can answer those if you want, but our bear population right now is, is probably is, is stable for the last 10 years, and it's fluctuating at numbers that is higher than our overall goal that we set in the 10 year big game plan. That's 3,500 to 5,500. So our average is probably around 5,800. It's probably creeping up higher than that. That's the facts we know. Um, we don't know how many sows are getting shot out there that have cubs. We know sows are taken. We know it does happen some. We know what the woods are like in the cornfields that people are shooting bears in right now. Uh, you could very easily go out there and shoot a sow and it could have cubs and you wouldn't know it. They're not attached by the umbilical cord. They're not right there. Some are, some aren't. You're, you're not hunting in open areas where this would got caught on a game camera, I guess. I think what you heard too, which, which I appreciate Mr. Phelan's comment, was I don't know personally, and I think many of you don't know anyone out there who would go out there and willingly shoot a cow, shoot a sow if it had cops. Does it happen? Yeah, it got caught on game camera. I guess. Does, I'm not going to dispute that does. But I think our education program really works, and, and we push that. For, for a lot of reasons. It's always in our law digest. Under education covers that, so all types of hunting um, when they do that. And, and I'd say it's working. We are, our bear population is not in trouble. What's in trouble is people moving into bear country and, and having lots of human conflicts with bears. So it's on us, um, not, on, not on the bear numbers with that. What I also ask you not to take this up at this time, and, and not even just, just as an item, is we want to come with a formal presentation to you on bear management state and talk about these things. What are the threats to our bear population? How are our current regulations got us to where we are um, with the bear? What are some things and get your input on things that you think we need to be looking at seriously and tweaking? Um, at any time, we can open the bear management rule um, to do that on your behalf, or if we have an interest, we would do it. Um, to do that. I'm asking this time, I don't feel it needs to be open just to address this incident um, that happens right here. We have no idea on, on this, but go ahead, Brad. So yeah, that's a good point. When when do you expect to come to us? With I, looked at, I looked at our schedule and, and I don't know if we want any more six or seven hour uh, nightly meetings. I, I'm thinking uh, September would probably be when we go back and do the um, potentially the second or third vote on the on the fur bear rule amendment, then we would have time because this I would not have you sit through um, two hours talking on a subject and then two morals on bear management. We're not going to do justice to bear management to talk in, in half an hour. You'll need a couple hours. I think Mr. Phelan raised an awful lot of good points that, that I'd like to have our staff get into. So um, definitely can happen this year. So can I also just yeah. correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah. Even if um, we were to take up this petition and ask you to, to if, if we as a board were to accept this petition yeah. and, and support a change, yeah. that change wouldn't happen. Well, first of all, yeah. but, but what, what would the time, would that not be during this bear season? Right. 
it would be for a year plus from now. Yeah, before that rule would even go into effect. Right. Even if we came to you and created a special meeting for next month. Correct. Right. Yeah. So with you giving us our presentation on, on bear management in September, um, in theory, well, whatever the board wants to do, we could either act on this tonight or we could wait till after we have a bear the formal bear presentation from you and your department and then formally act on this petition. So it's called not this fall, but the following fall, you can enact new regulations um, that you want. And I think that's more prudent. Um, it's, you know, we just went through some pretty complex stuff on fur bear management. Bear is just as much there, but we do know pretty darn well the status of our bear population throughout the state of Vermont. Um, we've got an awful lot of data on that and, and from everything from sex race to the age and we've done survival studies on so so there's a lot that i would hope you could process and i'd really like to have a night to focus on that before we jump to making changes in, in the bear current bear regulations uh just a comment um so uh, i understand the idea behind the petition is is good uh I don't want to reject the petition solely on the fact that the bear population is healthy, um, but there's other parts to this that uh, make sense to reject the petition because I always hate making a rule when we don't have all the information uh, regarding that. Uh, so it's it's I'm glad to hear that we'll be covering that, uh, having the bear presentation. I'd like to know if um, the hunter surveys if. The question is asked. I know we talked. It asks about what animals have you seen in the woods, but can a question be put in there? Did you see a sow with cubs? We can do that in future years when we do it. I don't think we asked it on the current, the last one. We did a big game plan or... neither. I don't believe we did. Okay. We don't do those every year. We try to plan them because of the cost, and we try to do it on oh, five okay. year cycles. Gotcha. All right, but I think it makes sense to get some cheap information, really. Uh, before making a uh, a true decision on a rule, but there is some good, I guess, ideas or heart behind the petition. As thoroughly prepared as this presentation was, I believe the first point is that not been demonstrated by this to my satisfaction that there is a problem. I think it's probably the, uh, I'm I'm sorry. This this whole conversation, I, I've lost it in terms of being able to hear. Thank you for the reminder, David. We will raise our voices. Okay. I am not necessarily in a position where I'm ready to approve this petition, but I certainly am not ready to reject it either. I think it's very, I mean, based on just my knowledge of the subject, I think they're very well written, very well researched, very well presented petition. And without hearing all the reasons why the department is not necessarily in favor of it, I mean, I can't see any harm in approving the petition person. Um, but I think we do need more time. And even if we did approve it, it wouldn't take effect this year anyways. So I guess my thought or, or recommendation would be to try to, can we table it until we have further discussion on it anyways? Or, or, or I mean, I, 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 without hearing from the department, I, I, I don't see any problem with that. I, I do think, I would say that I do think that you're, Estimation of how much it happens. I think I think you have a very a uh, very uh, optimistic view of how much it would help. Again, I, I I had this discussion with you. I I don't know a hunter that would do that personally. Does it happen? Of course it does. It, it raises an interesting question: of who would admit to having done it if they've done it? You know that it's, right. it's 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 a and I'm not faulting the department on this. The data about how many pups are orphaned or how many sales of pups are killed is not collected and I don't think it can be reliably collected because people aren't going to admit to that. Yeah, there's no way it could be. And, and the other thing I want to say is killing sows in order to manage the bear population, like inflicting the 
the harm on them. I answer that in Appendix B. That's not a management tool to kill the mother. If you kill the mother, because then the cubs will die, and that's great. I'm trying to spare the cubs. There's some other solution to that. More bear permits, you know, a, a bigger bag, bag limit. Here's not to leave the cubs to suffer. Yeah, so just before, Brian, just to answer your question initially about could it be tabled, we, what we've done in the past, knowing that uh, the department is on the verge of doing something, uh, doing a presentation or, or like the rule, we have just forwarded the, 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 uh, the petition to the department and then we basically take it up after the presentation. And we can hold it until then. So tabling it is essentially what we're doing. Okay, so, yeah. I'm okay with that. I'm definitely not in favor of rejecting. So somebody else just kind of. Yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of between the, the two here. Uh, I, I agree that I, I think this is a good petition. I, it makes sense. Um, and Mark's response that, you know, we got a good handle on our beer population and, and uh, we don't think this is happening much. Um, and I hate make regulations because uh we don't think something happened much so we don't we don't think we need it and even if we made it there those will break it i have some concerns about how this would impact enforcement issues like if somebody shot a sow and then the neighbor saw two cubs that the hunter never saw and that could become kind of muddied um but i think the merit of this you know like we say most people wouldn't do this obviously if you do like we have laws against the UI, but people still do it. So, um, but I would really like to have more information from the department uh, before we just off the face reject this. Okay, uh, one more, Michael. Before I thought Michael had that first. Uh, uh, I, I guess what I'd say is I, I wouldn't be for opening the bear rule for this petition. So I think it makes sense to table the petition until we open the bear rule for any changes we're going to make anyways. So. Okay. Okay, any questions from uh, the members? <laughs> I, I, I was just about to say that sounded like a motion to me. Do I have, uh, does somebody want to make a motion to um, take some action here? I'll make a motion that we table this petition until the department has time to, to formulate a response uh, to help us make this decision. And to time that, can I just add this piece of it? Absolutely. To time that to the fair management presentation Correct. overall. Only beginning in September. That's absolutely right. I'll second that motion. I just want to make sure it's clear. I think it makes sense. And we take the time and respond to this, you know, because it's, it's a lot of work and, and it deserves it. I also don't want you to, under, to think that we're going to be back next month for this. Oh, no, absolutely. Because we have a lot of work in the intervening time. It, it, so give it its due. It, it could be September where you see it. I, I don't like to hurry through any of this because there's everything we do was a lot to some of us that don't know so well and it needs to be delivered that's i think it's fair to the petitioner to do that too yeah. okay so we have a motion on the floor to table this until um the department um presents us with their bear overall bear management plan and that we will take this petition consideration at that point and respond to it so, and I have a second, I have a second to that, Brian um, right. Bailey. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. Well, let's, let's do this um, one at a time. Okay, Michael Bancroft. Yes. Uh, Brian Bayless. Yes. Nicholas Burnham. Yes. David Dean. Yes. Uh, Brad Merlin, yes. Uh, Allison Frazier. Yes. Uh, Neil Hogan. Yes. Michael Colson? Yes. Ryan McCarthy? Yes. Uh, Paul Noel? Yes. Robert Patterson? Yes. Jay Sweeney? Yes. Martin Van Buren? Yes. Okay, the ayes have it. Thank you very much. Okay, next on the agenda for tonight is item number four. It's the 2023 Angelus Deer Permits and Youth Novice Season 
um, presentation. Yeah, that's important. Um, so this is coming from the department for proposal. Um, we've held three public hearings already, get input on gear. Um, what was quite noticeable at the hearings and board members that were there could, could recall this is that most of the comments and the questions that we received had nothing to do with the number of antlers permits that were that we're going to be recommending this year. Hopefully the next two public hearings that we're going to do, they'll have something to respond to. But if it follows the last couple of years, we don't get a lot of pushback on our current program of managing the deer herd by using the antlers permits with muzzle loaders and being able to hunt antlers deer statewide through archery. So we're this is our proposal this year. I think if anything, the hardest fact is is when Nick speaks, think about actually how many deer in the landscape is this really going to affect um, this proposal. I think when hunters hear about 22,000, they probably, if they're like me, they're thinking back in the 1960s and 70s, when you issued that many permits, you had an awful lot of deer being shot because we were using high powered rifles and, and, and so forth. So um, anyways, that's what most of the comments and questions came on changing the deer rule. Everything from the one buck limit to the bag limits to Things, things like that. We did start getting a few comments from people um, that wanted to move to why can't I get a permit? This was interesting. There are some areas where we don't issue a lot of antlers permits. So they can be entering a lottery in that area and they won't get a permit. That's the reality um, of the situation. So I've asked Nick tonight to, to take his time. What I'm asking the board for is their action is to do what's kind of like a quote first vote on these permit numbers by each unit. So as you listen to the proposal tonight, and when we go to that vote, if you have concerns about the numbers that the department is proposing on any wildlife management unit, please speak up. But now's the time so we can get out there a reasonable number. Then you're gonna hear Nick's response to the departments on why that number is there now. So he's gonna walk you through each wildlife management unit, as well as giving there some new board members. I think you're prepared, aren't you, to talk a little bit about Deer management and the different various models that we use to have confidence in our deer numbers and our estimates and the permit recommendations. So I won't introduce Nick Formalang. You've all had that before um, to do that. So is that okay? Any questions? And what we're we're not looking for like a a final vote. That'll be in late May. It'll be actually be the, the fourth Wednesday of the month. Um, we're moving it back so that you can also vote on the bait fish regulations um, at your hearings. And between, between now and then, there are going to be a couple more public. More public yep. And um, that's the way we've kind of done it. So I'm going to have a chance for don't have to, but that's the board kind of thought that was a good idea to do the hearings. That's why instead of doing them all before we even know how many permits we're going to recommend. Question on the public hearings. And Mark, you kind of look like Jesus right now with the. <laughs> right now, the deer hearing from Montpelier is May 11th, which is the corporate cup day. So, are we going to have a public hearing at 6:30 when the corporate cup starts at six? You think that's going to be a usually so pretty they start at the high school there? I'm, I'm 40 years since I went to that race. Start in front of the state house, go okay. back across the bridge, back in. Parking should be an issue. And you have a bait fish rule. Same virtual night. hearing the same night, which makes it difficult for us to attend both. I didn't know that. Yeah, that should have happened. We scheduled the air on our part. We had our, okay. Um, so we'll go to change that, I guess. It's, we'll. Try. We'll try because we're running into a real challenge right now, having these hearings at schools. They, they, there's an issue with them in the contract that we need on the state in terms of insurance that we get you all get on getting there. Thanks for that. I didn't know. And, and then um, and the bait fish thing uh, that snuck in on us. Okay, so we'll deal with that. But, but so we'll we'll change that date. Right. We, we got you. We don't yeah. want to have it's either change your location. Um, yeah, I mean, I, they're available 
the day before, the day after. Right. I hope we can just move it. Yeah, we don't want to have the same day. It has more to do with the public notice. And I'm not going to pretend to be a lawyer. Yeah, fair enough. Try to share this. As Mark mentioned, uh, I'm going to spend a little time going over some beer ology and management. Since you had a light agenda tonight, we didn't let you leave too early. Um, and then we'll get into that. But I do want to touch on uh, a few elements of, of beer biology that I think are important and very relevant to this. And, and as a lot of you are new, you probably haven't seen this before. Um, the other thing I want to start with, because the number one question we always get when we present these things is, how do you come up with your number? How do you estimate your number? So I want to touch real quick on, on the population models we use. This is just real general conceptual stuff. I'm not getting into any of the details. Um, no math here. So one of the models we use, and it's one of my favorite models, um, really not useful in a short-term sense, like it doesn't tell me how many deer there were last year, but I can look back in time a few years, and this is probably our most reliable model, so it's really helpful for making sure the other models I'm gonna talk about are actually tracking the population with population actions. So first one is, is generally called a reconstruction model. Um, I'll be more specific and say it's an age reconstruction model. So this model works on the premise that if someone shoots a three-year-old deer last fall, that deer was obviously still alive the year before. Still alive. Obviously alive the year before as a two-year-old and the year before that as a one-year-old. So in that way, we can add deer back through time, um, come up with a minimum population estimate. Um, so if you add them all back, we know all of those deer were alive in year one as yearlings in this example. Um, so it not only gives us a reliable population estimate, but it also gives us an age structure to our population. Again, we have to, for our bucks, most of them don't live past four, so we gotta go back at least four, maybe six years before we have kind of a full picture, but it's a really helpful model um, for a lot of things. Another model we use, um, this one, a lot of states use this, is probably the most common deer population model in the US. Uh, it's called the sex age kill model. This is a different type of reconstruction, and reconstruction just means we're looking back in time. In this case, we're just looking to last fall using our harvest data. So the premise here is that if we knew, obviously we know how many deer are killed. We have good mandatory reporting in Vermont. We know how many deer are killed, bucks particularly. Um, if we knew what the harvest rate was, say we knew hunters killed half of the bucks that were out there. All we have to do then is double the harvest and that's how many bucks were out there. Um, the harvest rate is not 50% less than that, but um, generally speaking, that's how we get to our puck population. The full version of this to get to an actual population, there's a lot of lines here, but you have that buck harvest, you know your buck harvest rate, that tells you how many bucks were out there. To get to a doe population, all you need to know is your sex ratio, right? How many does per buck are out there? Um, believe it or not, we can actually get that very accurately from age structure data. We have the age structure of our males and our females and figure out that ratio. But we can get that pretty reliably. That gives us a doe estimate. And then if we know how many fawns there are per doe, it's actually the toughest one to estimate, we get a fawn estimate. Add those all up, that's your deer population estimate. Looking backwards. So this is how we get after the hunting season, how we get to last fall's estimate at the start of hunting season. And the other one we use uh, heavily is called the DOPOP model. Um, 
it tracks the doe population, female portion of the population. And this looks like a lot of stuff going on, but basically it's an accounting model. It's called an accounting model because it accounts for just like balancing your checkbook, your bank account. You account for all of the losses to the population from hunting, uh, wounding, winter mortality, predation, whatever. Um, group all those into non-hunting for winter. Um, and then, of course, births, the additions. Track those through time. Um, this model actually never resets. This keeps going. We add, we put in the harvest each year in the winter severity index, and this model just keeps rolling, and it tracks our population incredibly well. We tweak it to make sure all those things work. But um, this, importantly, is the way we look forward. So when I'm giving you an estimate for this coming fall, this is how I'm projecting from last fall's estimate, which we got from a reconstruction model, to look forward and predict how many deer we think we're going to have this coming fall at the start of these coming hunting season. Um, yeah, and, and this again, this model we tweak it now and then, but it, it really does a good job. Um, most important thing, though, we don't even need to know how many deer there are. Not a critical piece of information for managing a deer population. Um, anytime someone questions how, not anytime, some people are genuinely curious about the math. Very few. Most of the time, when people question how to come up with deer numbers, it's the start of a line of questioning that ultimately wants to get to, I don't believe you. I think you're overestimating deer numbers. And that's the only reason you're trying to kill as many deer as you, as you are. We're not basing this on the number of deer, right? We don't need to know how many there are. What we do need to know is which way is the population going? Up, down, stable. And most importantly, are we in balance with what the habitat can support with carrying capacity? That is all that matters. Whether there's 10 deer per square mile or 20 deer per square mile, I don't really care. But if it's too many for the habitat, we know we have to reduce deer numbers. That's really what we're we're focused on. Um, so here's your first ecological lesson of the night. What is carrying capacity? Right, we talk about it and try not, I try not to use the term carrying capacity. It is the most misused term in ecology by far. But at its core, it is exactly what you think it is. Like the basic principle, it is the maximum number of animals here, in this case, that an area can support over time. The time part is critical, right? For a day, an area can support a lot of deer. But if you want to do that for 10 years or 100 years, it's a different number. Um, so I'm going to run through a quick example to show um, how kind of a concept of carrying capacity, but how an area can actually exist, how a deer population can exist above carrying capacity for a long period of time, and what impact that can have on the habitat and then on carrying capacity. So our theoretical little piece of habitat here, let's say it supports 20 deer, right? So if you add two more, what happens? Nothing happens <laughs> in the short term. But over time, habitat starts to get impacted, right? Those two more deer are eating food too. So you have less food for each individual deer. Any plants that are there that deer actually like are going to get overeaten. They're going to eat those first. And then you're going to get start getting the undesirable stuff, whether those are invasives or just plants that deer don't want to eat. Those are going to start to do better because the deer are helping them compete. <laughs> Um, and of course, as deer have less food and less quality food per deer, their physical condition is going to start to decline. And that's going to be a big theme throughout the night. That's kind of our focus of management is on that. Physical. So over time, you just start to see the habitat degrade. And this can take a long, long time, decades in some places. Just from having slightly too many deer, but you still have too many deer. It's not like the population declines on its own. Okay, you remove two deer, back to 20, what happens? Can that area support 20 deer now? No, that, okay. that's too great. That area cannot support 20 deer anymore. And this doesn't necessarily just happen from deer. This could be forest, you know, forest maturing, habitat changes over time. But 
a habit that can't support 20 deer. So getting back to 20 is not of any value. The question is, how low do you have to go before that habitat improves? Or to get to what that could support, or if you want that to actually improve, how low do you have to go to allow that habitat to recover? And that is a million dollar question. I don't think we could ever answer in most places. A um, couple of key parts here to think about. That was an oversimplified example, right? Just to prove a point. In reality, habitat quality, carrying capacity is constantly changing. It changes through the year, right? A month ago, our carrying capacity was real low. Well, maybe two months ago, we didn't have much of a winner. But, um, right now and for the next couple of months, it's real high. Dips in late summer, high in the fall again, you know, it changes through the year. That's not really how we think of it through the year. We think of it over, over years, but from year to year, it also changes a lot. As forests mature, they support less deer. You know, there's research in Pennsylvania. Um, I think they say uh, young forest habitat. And I don't know what the age range they use, but probably like three to 15 year old, you know, clear cuts, young forest can support like 40 to 80 deer per square mile. A pole stand, you know, six inch trees with nothing growing underneath them, five or fewer deer per square mile. So incredible differences as habitats age and change. Um, winters not the same every year, right? Some years their winters are harder than others, so that affects carrying capacity over the course of the year. Constantly changing, which makes measuring it about pointless, right? You measure it, you get one point in time, and it's different every other year after that, um, whether higher or low. The other thing that really complicates this, and this does affect us in a few parts of Vermont, right, is what we call density independent factors. Um, basically, things that are not impacted, not affected by how many deer are out there, no matter how many deer we have. Um, the prime examples of this are agriculture. So farmers plant crops every year. Deer can eat the whole thing, and there'll just be more of it next year. The deer have no impact on, on how much of it's out there, right? The other one is mass crops. Deer can eat every little oak seedling that's out there, but that big oak tree is still going to produce acorns every year, as long as it lives. So those things keep coming, and that's we have parts of the state where those have a significant influence and can actually keep our deer moderately healthy, even though there are too many. Otherwise, for the habitat to support. Um, also, greatly complicates estimating carrying capacity. Um, as I think you all know, uh, we do have deer density goals in our 10 year plan. <laughs> that is our objective. And this is essentially our best guess at what carrying capacity is in each WMU. This is the number of deer we think is sustainable long term. It is an estimate. Arguing that. What matters a lot more, as I said, is those physical condition metrics. And this is a lot on one slide, and don't try to read those, but um, for every WMU, we have thresholds for antler size, for body weight. Those are where that's how that's telling us how we're doing it relative to carrying grass, is those physical condition thresholds. In order to come up with how many deer we want to kill each year, that's where we use the density estimates, right? We figure this is where we are. We actually use actual number of deer, not density, but this is where we are. This is where we think we need to be. How many deer do we have to kill to get there? That's why we use the numbers. Um, but the physical condition stuff is, is, is the more important information. I think most of you have seen this um, before, but again, some of you are, are new. Um, when we look at physical condition, one of the key metrics here we use is yearling antler beam diameter. A measure antler size in, in year and a half old bucks. It is the most widely used assessment of deer population health. Um, your young animals, you know, they're the ones that, that suffer first if the habitat's limited, if, if they can't get enough nutrition. They're the ones that are gonna are gonna show it more so than older animals. Um, we've tracked this since the 60s. Mark mentioned, um, well, he said the 60s, but when we really killed a lot of does was in the, uh, right around 1980. <laughs> um, greatly reduced the deer population, physical condition improved, 
And for the last 30 years, we've seen this slow, steady decline. Um, your numbers have been, they go up and down, but generally stable over that time. I think most of that is declining habitat quality, mainly our aging forests. Um, I am hopeful can't see that, um, that we're starting to see a little uptick in, those, in the last couple of years. Uh, it's too early to tell for sure, um, but should. We've been knocking the numbers back. We should see that. Um, so, you know, this is some a, a, a good indicator that we have been above carrying capacity in a lot of the state. Um, hopefully we've corrected some of that, but clearly over the past 30 years, we've had slightly too many deer. Um, and just I, for additional reference to see how we compare to our neighbors um, in this same metric, you know, the beam diameter, uh, not very well is the answer. Um, all of our neighboring states have considerably higher antler beam diameters. Um, clear indication that we can do better. We have the same deer. Um, we're just, we've, we've had too many deer. So we can't. Um, next ecological lesson before we get into the thing, uh, I want to go over just how productive white tailed deer are. And as a result, just how resilient a deer population is to mortality. Um, so these are actual data from Vermont, collected by our wardens, um, primarily. Um, so every year now, you know, there are roadkill deer out there. They're out there counting fetuses in those deer. Um, so pregnancy by age class, we break. For productivity purposes, we break deer, and I'll show you why in a second, but we break deer into adult, which really means two years old or older, yearling, which are those one and a half year old deer when they, when they breed in the fall, so you're gonna have old. And then fawns, which are deer that would be breeding at essentially six months old, seven months old. Um, and we actually do see some of our fawns breed. Most of them didn't have winter, would breed in like February before they actually mature enough. Um, most of them can't get there before winter. But anyway, most of our adult deer, year and a half and older, are pregnant every year, almost 95. Um, this is there's two measurements, fecundity and birth rate. Fecundity is if a deer is pregnant, how many fetuses does it have? So it, it ignores the ones that aren't pregnant. But see, most of your older deer, almost all of them have twins, um, slightly more singles than triplets, but almost all of them. Twins, a year and a half old deer, they're about half singles and half twins. Um, so averaging about 1.5 fawns per doe. And then amazingly enough, if a fawn conceives, about a quarter of them actually conceive twins. Um, but it's still a very minor part of it. You add those pregnancy and fecundity together, this is how many fawns are born per deer. The fawns we just ignore. It's so few, and the odds are the vast majority of those do not survive because they're just either not in good enough condition or don't under, don't know how to raise a fawn. Um, so we pretty much ignore fawn. The, the fawn itself doesn't survive, or the no, no, the, the offspring, the offspring okay. likely don't survive. Right? Uh, they give birth to very few, and it's uncommon. So the the addition there is is negligible. Um, so adults again pretty high um, that's actually pretty good uh productivity from adult deer yearlings 1.35 is not there should be less difference between mature does and year and a half old you always expect them to be lower because if they are first time breeders they're not as um physically they're not in that good physical condition but um i did my masters on this same thing in new hampshire and their yearlings i think were at about one point six 1.58 something like that so much closer to the adult productivity um again that's that evidence that we've had too many deer in summer um it's a little hard to see but this is actually by age so tracking this this was all the way up to 17 year olds and you see that um fawns really uh really don't produce many fawn yearlings um a little lower once they're two they're pretty much producing, most of them are producing twins every year until they reach their teens. And then that starts to decline um, because they're 
geriatric at that point. Um, but oddly, they, I mean, they'll still produce fetuses following the process. Um, so fear incredibly growth. Kind of illustrate this. This is an example of our deer population, right? It's 100 deer, but 25 yearlings, that's about 25% of our doe population in a year and a half. Pretty um, accurate depiction. They produce 165 farms, those 100 does. In whatever, starting in about a month, they're dropping. Um, so incredible productivity, and this is every year. About 83, it's about half, basically. Half of those fawns survive till fall, no matter what. A lot of them get eaten by predators, mostly coyotes, um, black bears too. Um, but even if they didn't, half of them are going to die of something, um, no matter what. And that's okay, because there were way too many of them. There's no way we could have done something with all 165 of those fawns. We don't have room to put them, right? It's okay that half of them die. Um, deer are food, and they evolved to be food and for a lot of them to die. Um, so about half of them make it to fall. And again, we know from our data, this one we're more confident in. Um, about 50 of those are going to make it to one year old. Last spring spawned about 50 of those 165, which is, I don't know what that works out to percentage wise, 30% make it to one year old. Um, and if you do the math already in your head, um, fawns, of course, are half male, half female. So 25 female fawns become your 25 yearlings in the next year. And that continues. <laughs> I recruited more than 50, population increases. You are, you that assumes, of course, that 25 of your adult does die, be replaced by pawns. If that doesn't happen, fewer of them die. You have 25 new females coming in, population increases. One of the first things, and it's the hardest thing to measure, but one of the first impacts you see um, when a population is above carrying capacity is uh, reduced juvenile survival. So in this case, reduced recruitment of fawns. And it's incredibly difficult to measure, so it's not often something that's used or measured by agencies because we just can't reliably get that information. There's no good way to do it um, on an on a annual basis. Um, but basically what happens here is if you killed more does, we killed 30 instead of 25, and I say we killed that's all sources of mortality. We're not, this is an all hunting, right? Um, but if we harvest more, so the total is more than 25, very likely more of those fawns are gonna survive to adulthood. Immediately, over time, as habitat improves and condition improves, it'll be even more, but immediately you actually can see an increase in fawn survival. And so that's why when we kill more does in, in, during hunting season, it's not like a one-to-one -one relationship with the impact it has on the population. There's some compensation because of all that reproduction going on. Um, and all those fawns looking for a spot that don't have one unless we remove an adult deer to make room for them. Um, this is your ecology lesson for the evening. Uh, so onto the recommendation. I'm not gonna go through every single WMU. I'm gonna focus on a few that are above objective um, and and where we were changing permit allocations. Um, if anyone has questions on the ones I don't talk about, I'm happy to. Question on the last thing you just said, though. The, a common public comment we get is you kill one doe, you kill two deer, three deer total. So what you're saying is you kill one doe, you add a deer? From a... Someone wants to argue that if you kill a doe, you are also, its its fawns won't be born the following spring. That is correct. That is why we kill does. Um, but obviously we're not actually killing those. Those deer don't exist yet, so we're not killing them. In reality, from a population perspective, you remove one deer, it's probably getting replaced. You probably haven't had a, a 
one deer impact on the population. Maybe it's a fraction of a deer impact, you know, depending on, again, the level, the extremity of it. When we have fairly light antlerless harvests, it probably all comes out in the wash, like it balances, right? You removed a deer, but then another one took its place. In places where we're really trying to kill a lot, because we're removing so many, probably removing one is like removing half from the overall population, that sort of, you know, relationship. But um, there's always some compensation because there's so many fawns out there looking for a spot. Um, okay, on to the recommendation. Um, so first thing last winter was easy. Wasn't much of a winter. Um, March was our one sort of normal month, but until March, uh, we were on pace to be the easiest winter ever through February. Um, our total statewide winter severity was uh, 16. Uh, average over the past 30 years is, I don't remember exactly what it was, I think it's 37. Um, that's the median, so half the time it's above, half the time it's below. Um, we typically don't see at least at the statewide level, we don't see a decline in deer numbers until winter severity hits 50, right around 50. Um, so we're nowhere near that. Um, the other thing I want to point out here, though, the last four years combined collectively, or the last three years, either one, are the easiest three or four year stretch since we started tracking this in 1970. Um, so incredibly easy string of winters here. Um, that is true statewide. Um, you see our 30 year median by WMU on the right. This past winter on the left, just easy winter statewide. Um, winter is always harder in northern Vermont, but actually um, it didn't work out by WMU, but some of our stations in northern Vermont that have, that have recorded data for um, 30, 40 years <laughs> had their easiest winter in the past ever, in the past, since they've been keeping track of those stations. Winter severity starts impacting deer and the um, population. Does that impact the, the, the fawns, the yearlings, and the uh, adults equally, or does it does it focus more specifically on an area? Great question. So um, most of the impact is on fawns. You're going through their first one. Uh, really hard winters, you'll see, you know, adult mortality, outside of hunting is normally somewhere around 85 or survival is around 85%. So 15% are dying outside of hunting. In a hard winter, adult mortality in a really bad winter maybe goes down to 75% immediately. Bonds start around 70%, but they below 70%, even an average winter. And in a really bad winter, they go down to 50%. Um, so, impact we really see from a hard winter is you don't have any yearlings, you know, very few yearlings, year and a half old deer that come in the fall and fall. What it will affect the adults is the fawns they give birth to after that winter, um, they tend to lose a lot more of them early because they're in poor condition and they need to recover, so they tend to see more fawns die um, after, after they're born. Um, yeah, so it was an easy winter. Normally, that would mean an increase in deer numbers. Um, but we've had pretty high antlerless harvests over the last three years. And I know it's three maps in one is not great here, but um, I mentioned earlier, so our most reliable population estimates are when we look back. Okay, if I look back to last fall, we are pretty confident in that. So that's the map on the right. That's our deer density estimate on the right. Projecting forward to this coming fall is a little more complicated because there's, you know, we don't know exactly how many fawns are going to survive through the summer. We don't know exactly what went over winter survival was. We can predict it pretty reliably, but it's not as perfect as looking back. Um, so 2023 projected in, in the middle, and that's what we're basing our recommendation off. But I just want to show that it's really not that different from what we had last fall. Most of the changes are one or two deer per square mile, which quite frankly is, is our margin of error. Um, so most of it, it, it's all up, so definitely increases, but how big those increases are. Um, bigger deal is 
in a lot of WMUs, we are well above where we want to be. Right? We have far more deer than we think is sustainable. So we're trying to reduce deer numbers in um, eight, yeah, eight WMUs uh, this year. The yellow areas, uh, we're trying to keep deer numbers where they're at. So stabilize is the goal there. Um, so I'm going to touch on a few of these um, red ones. Um, we're actually changing deer numbers. And there's a few others where we're changing deer numbers or that are red that I'm not going to touch on. Um, we're not really changing much, um, but I'm happy to touch on them if anyone has questions. Um, so WMUA is the Champlain Islands. Um, what happened here is so 2020, you see on the, the one chart on the right is the collective antlerless harvest. Um, and this is the figure that figures that are in the recommendation. But 2020, with the new regulations, we saw this big spike in antlerless harvest in the islands. And we said, whoa, that is needed, but might be a little excessive. Um, so the last couple of years, we've been we backed off on, on antlerless permit numbers. The archer harvest also came down. Not limiting, but just probably less participation. Um, and we thought that 2020 would have an impact on the population, but it has not as yet. It has done nothing. So we're basically trying to get back up there. Um, we're going to try to issue a thousand permits this year. That's about the most we've ever given, actually successfully gotten rid of in the islands. Um, this will essentially be our maximum. So if we can't kill enough deer with a thousand permits and with you know our current regulations, we're gonna have to look at other tools. This is also to one of my points, a good example of an area where we have a ton of deer, but they're actually in decent condition. And that is because the entire world is a food plot. Um, tons of agriculture, very easy winners. Um, so they're in really good condition, but the little bits of forest that exist in the islands are decimated right here. Yeah. Um, so that's the issue here. It's not the health of the deer, it's the health of the forest, health of the, the natural ecosystems there. We really need to try to do something to bring deer numbers down. Uh, WB, um, Northern Champlain Valley. Similar situation, not nearly as many deer. Um, deer numbers have been more stable here and maybe slowly trending down, but certainly not fast enough. Um, here is an area where the physical condition is not ideal, and it's an area with a lot of agriculture. It should be pretty good, and it's not, which tells us we definitely have too many deer. Um, so again, we bumped this back up to 5,000 permits. Um, we've given out 5,500 in the past successfully. Uh, hopefully 5,000 is enough to just start tipping us over the edge and, and reducing the population a little quicker. Um, C, um, C is a tricky one. So the population trend here on the left has been incredibly stable over the past, say, eight years, seven or eight years. Um, and the model predicts a pretty good spike this coming fall, and that's one where I, I question it, right? I, I'm not, I think that has to do with how easy the winter was, um, and and the, I mean, the antlerless harvest last fall wasn't wasn't much different. So I think that's just related to how easy the, our winter severity index was, which may not actually play out in reality. Um, so we're not changing the permit numbers. We're not recommending a change in permit numbers. We're going to keep it at 500. Um, basically, similar antlerless harvest to what we've had. Um, physical condition of deer here is not great. Um, but the challenge in this unit is, I don't know what the percentage is, but a large percentage of the deer harvest and the deer population is on the western fringe of the unit, basically Enosburg and Bakersfield which should, in an ideal world, be part of B, if we had a better place to draw the line. Um, the mountainous part of the unit has fairly low deer densities, like the rest of 
our mountains. Um, and the other thing I'll point out here is, is the, the buck harvest on the right, the green line on the right, has been steadily increasing over the past 10 years. But keep in mind the last three years, they've been able to shoot spike horns. So whether that's actually still increasing or that's just because they can now shoot spike horns and maybe it's plateaued or even declined. So that's a little apprehension there, which is why we're not uh, increasing permits. Um, a similar thing could be said about uh, WMUG, which I'm not going to talk about. But again, we're not changing anything, even though it's still above objective. But we, we think we should hold it steady, and hopefully, if we actually get our average winner, even it'll it'll do what we want it to do. Um, D1. Um, D1 is one where we have been above objective since 2014. The boundary was changed. So as long as we've been measuring the seven year, we've been above where we want to be now. Um, none of our past antlers harvests have been adequate to actually bring it down. So we're actually recommending an increased, slight increase here to a thousand permits. Um, I know I've heard from folks here that in the last couple of years claim they haven't seen as many deer. Um, while hunting, but all of our data says they still have plenty of deer. Um, they, they may not be seeing as many bucks. There may not be quite as many deer, but there are definitely more deer than we want. Again, physical condition not great here. Um, but also gives me a little, um, I'll say confidence in increasing permit numbers is we I've had fairly high antlers harvests over the past, well, at least in 2020 and 2018 in this unit, and they really didn't do anything. We didn't see a huge impact from those. So we're not even quite getting up to those levels. At least we don't think we're going to get up to those levels. So it's unlikely that this is going to cause the population to tank, even if there is a hard winter. So uh, I think it's something we need to do. We need to start being a little more aggressive in this unit. Yeah, do, do. Do we sell the majority of the 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 um, permits that you recommend? So yeah. In this case, a thousand. Do we actually sell that many? Yep. So there's only a couple. Um, I think <laughs> A will be close, um, and and wardens could speak to. I believe a lot of the folks who fill their permit in the in the incorrect spot have an A permit, so we sell them, but they don't necessarily get use where they should or or use at all right um the other place the only place last year we didn't sell them all is f1 let's go yeah D, d1 there's a lot of demand generally northern vermont we can sell all of our firm a lot of hunters they will kill whatever we let them kill um so the, when you see the fill rate on this other chart yeah. that fill rate is relative to the this number here that we want to start the thousand yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, D1, that's 211 out of 1,000 is a 21% fill rate rate. So, and that, that's one of our higher fill rates, too. Um, so, yeah, this, we don't have any problem in these. Um, F1, we we did not sell all the permits last year. And we're recommending an increase this year um, from 1,500 up to 1,800 permits. Um, this is a unit where the population has just been steadily increasing over the past decade. Um, buck harvest, likewise, um, very similar to the Champlain Island, right? Mild winters and lots and lots and lots of agriculture. Um, we have not killed enough animals here in this area to impact the population yet. So we're trying to increase it, whether we actually can or not. Thanks. Um, the other thing I'll point out here, so physical condition generally pretty good. Again, lots of agriculture. Bean diameter this year dropped below our threshold there. Um, and over the past three years has dropped a millimeter a year. So it was it was 18 two years ago, it was 17 last year, now it's 16.3. So it is coming down like a rock. Um, and that's these are three year averages, it's not just year to year to year. So um this increasing deer population has exceeded something already, whatever threshold it is, whether that's you know winter or whatever. Um, that's limiting their limiting factor, but they have exceeded it, and we need to catch up. Have an impact. 
a question. So a part of the unit is very challenging because it incorporates, you know, the Burlington, South Burlington, those areas where you can't hunt. Yeah, and I, I and, would actually argue that we probably, because of how we estimate deer, largely harvest-based, probably pretty much ignore any deer that exists in South Burlington and Burlington mm -hmm. because we just don't have a way of accounting for them. Um, we do need to work on figuring out a way to get some hunting in there um, because I think we're already starting to see an increase in, in complaints, nuisance complaints and issues in Burlington particularly. Um, and that's only going to get extra <laughs> forward. So um, we need to try to get ahead of that. But I think the bigger issue in this unit is, um, well, others can probably speak to it better, but I think just access to a lot mm -hmm. of Champlain Valley. It's just, it's hard. There are a lot of deer, but it's hard to actually find a place to hunt for a hunter to find a place to hunt. So. I'm hopeful we can actually get rid of all the permits here. Because again, if we can't, I, we have to we have to look at other options. Um, if it's fun. Um, last one I want to focus on here. Um, again, I can answer questions on any of the other ones. Last one I want to focus on is K. Okay. Um, so K, okay. I think most of you remember, but maybe the new board members all a couple years ago, we had a, a hemorrhagic disease outbreak in a small part of K. Um, and that is in, in the population density slide graph. That's that dip in 2021. Um, it is not clear whether that is an actual decline in the population or whether that is simply a result of hunters electing not to hunt that year, knowing that we had an EHC outbreak. Um, either way, population has come right back, apparently, whether it declined or not. Um, again, it's really stable, but above objective. Um, so we're going back to 3,000 permits. We may not get rid of all of them. Um, in the past, we haven't at 3,000. Um, you also, hay is also a great example of uh, the influence of mass crops on the harvest. So that's antlerless harvest doing this zigzag thing. The high points are bad oak acorn years. The low points are good acorn years. Um, and that's with basically the same number of permits issued every year. So that's, if the cycle holds, we should actually be in a low year this coming year, which wouldn't be ideal. But um, hopefully we can. Yeah, the unit we need to max out our antlers harvest. Um, we don't get for as many hunters as we have in K, and it's one of our highest uh, hunting pressure units, hunters per square mile. Um, I think it's really probably only behind uh, A and B are by far the highest, but K is not too far behind B. Um, we have a very minimal archery harvest in this area, and it's generally true of all of southern Vermont. We just don't have the archery hunters in southern Vermont. And so we have to issue a lot more antlers permits to reach the same harvest objective. And that becomes problematic. In northern Vermont, we can do most of what we need to do just with archery. So I'd love somehow to get more archery hunters in K, but. Um, so the overall proposal is um, as we have been for the past, I think most of the years that I've been in this position, um, archery season will be open to antlers hunting in all WMUs statewide. Archers can be up to four antlers here. Uh, anywhere in the state. Uh, the human and novice season would, as it has always been, continue to be one deer of either sex, anywhere in the state, all WMUs, and no antler restriction anywhere. Even in units that have an antler restriction during the other no antler restriction. Same as it's been forever. Uh, and then a total of 22,000 antlerless permits distributed by a wildlife management unit, as shown on the map, the tables in your document. So this is the overall proposal. And I guess at this point, I will take any questions. Um, well, 
David Robillard isn't here anymore to answer the P1 permits. Um, but, it, and I know it doesn't exactly pertain to antlerless harvest, but it, what was the 50% uh, threshold he was talking about? Um, yeah, so I didn't put this in here um, mainly to save time. And because I don't think we, it's something we should act on now, despite uh, David's desire. Um, so part of changing the um, antler restriction and the, the buck harvest regulations was we also set a um, objective in our 10 year big management plan that we would maintain um, less than 50% yearlings, year and a half old bucks in the harvest in all the big units. And if we couldn't do that, with no antler restriction, we would. We didn't say what we would do, but we would implement some sort of restriction to um, get it below 50%. Because that really, to get the number of mature bucks that hunters want, we need to stay below 50% yearlings. Like that just, it's an indication of how high our buck harvest rate is, what percentage of the bucks we're removing. So if hunters are killing, if more than 50% of our buck harvest is year and a half old deer, it tells us that we're, we're harvesting too many bucks to end up getting the number of mature bucks that um, we ultimately want. Um, in 2021, I did present those numbers because I believe because David was here and he expressed interest in it. Um, so I did present those numbers in 2021. It was uh, D1, D2, and actually E2, um, which kind of an anomaly, but um, that were above 50%. This past fall, it was C and D1, exactly like David thought it would be. Um, they were right at 50%. I think it was 50% in C and 53% in D1. Um, so those units have exceeded that threshold, um, D1 for two consecutive years now. My one caution on that is the current age structure of our population is such that we have a ton of one and a half and two and a half or this past fall, ton of one and a half and two and a half year old deer out there and very few three and four year old deer. So we're naturally going to see that shift, whether it's hunting pressure or not, this, you know, last year. This coming fall, I suspect we won't see it again. But if we do continue to see it, it's something we're going to have to address um, going forward because it's we're not meeting our buck age structure objectives. If we continue that. So just an observation is that based on what you present us tonight, I mean, it shows, I think that if we, if managing our deer population is much easier to do than managing our habitat, consequences to our negative consequences to our habitat have a lot longer lasting negative impact on our deer population than possibly taking too many deer in every in one year so we can recover from that much quicker. So building on what Michael asked you about, if D1 and C have gone over the 50% two years, and let's see, you're just D1, two years. C is officially your first. Okay. Should we we be waiting another year? Because I think I think the precedent was spoken to at that time. I, I would rec because of the age structure in our population right now, I would recommend waiting another year. Okay. Um, the other reality is, is even though we may, so I don't know if the commissioner actually has authority to change it right away, he probably does, yep. but it's already in the law book. Right? And we don't want to have one thing in the law book and a different thing in regulation um, in practice. So changing it for this coming fall is out of the question already. I think so. I would say hold off at this point, but if it continues to be the case next year, or even if it's at 48, 49%, we might want to have the conversation at least. Yep. What do we do? Yep. The other thing I'll add is 
you know, when we pass the regulations, and I think half of you probably weren't here when we did that, when we passed the regulation changes, um, you know, we agreed to five years to let this play out, see what happens, and then we'll review it at that point. My suggestion would be to let, that's, that's only two more years. My suggestion would be to let's see, let's get through those two years, and then if D1's a problem, figure something out, we'll, we'll make a change. And we'll, I, we, we do have to. I think you're right. We if said we would. We can't just be like, well, we have to actually do something. Sure. And we'll know that at the end of your season this fall. Yeah, I mean, we'll know after this coming fall, if we're over again, we we'll probably need to have the conversation regardless. That would be my suggestion. Um, so can I just to, to answer that question again, that, to ask follow up on that question. So by the time you know essentially where we stand with the um, with the numbers in January. Um, with the age stuff, I don't know until um, early April. Early April. Early April. So in one of the April meetings or. or yeah, well, this meeting next year essentially would be the time to, to when I would know that, be able to discuss that. Okay. And just thinking worst case scenario. So when when do you guys print the regulations? Send those to print. Well, September. Uh, yeah, September. September. Where do we have an agreement to go through a five year window yeah. of management before we open up the deer room again? Sure. And that's what we have to do on this, I believe. I don't think, think we have to. This is I only, mean, the procedure yeah. only allows us on permits. Yeah, no, we would have to open the deer yeah. rule and change it. And um, rather play it to see where it goes. There may, there may be other changes. To work. And I was just I was just trying to figure out whether that was even an option. It, it doesn't yeah. sound like it's even timing wise. Not a great. Option. I mean, I guess even if we were at the theory, if we acted next April, yeah, I don't know that. I don't know what they're like. I mean, like, well, to crack teeth, you get a lot of them. Um, we get a high percentage, or a I'm going to say of the teeth we get submitted by hunters, it's something somewhere between five and ten percent of them are not useful. Get an incredible selection, but actually have a jar in the Rutland office, kind of a joke of all the ridiculous teeth that people send us. Little <laughs> fragments of a tooth or molars. I mean, I know we're cutting down on them and popping um, them you, out. Is there if you cut deep enough, right? You're pretty good. The, the issue is usually because we need the, the root tip. Yeah. So the issue is usually that someone doesn't cut very deep and they just pry real hard and they break the top off. And we get the part you see of the tooth, but not the root that we need. Okay. Some of the guys question that. Yeah, yeah. And I, obviously, if you send a tooth in and you get your result back, right. it says it's broken. How many uh, archery licenses are we selling now? I know it's a three year average. I know COVID is more, but I think we sell about 20, I'm going to say 23, 24,000 somewhere in there. Um, but I, that's sales, so that wouldn't include permanent license holders. So I don't know how many archery hunters we have with Chris. The crossbow percent wise now? Crossbow was in the harvest report, but 76%, 1% higher than it was last year. Basically leveled off about three quarters of our Of course, we don't know the difference in success rates. So we don't have any are hunting with a crossbow yeah. versus very people. Um, okay. So if no one has other questions, next steps. Um, similar to the moose boat, um, we gave a presentation tonight. As Mark mentioned, we have the preliminary approval, which is basically just deciding what we go to the public with. Um, we have Two public hearings scheduled tonight in Middlebury, the 11th, which will 
probably change, at least the location. <laughs> I'll try. We'll have to see what we can do there. Um, right now, scheduled for the 11th in Las Vegas. Um, and then the, the recommendation is available on the website. It will be tomorrow. Um, and we'll probably maybe just put this presentation up there. Um, and then we can also take comments by email. Um, we've been taking comments, I should say, since actually before the March uh, meetings. So we have all the comments from those meetings that will get compiled from these two meetings. Um, we've received a handful of email comments. Um, I'm sure we'll have to get a few more. Um, but all that will be compiled in the final version of this document. Put all the public comments. And then the final vote, this says May 17th, but we move that uh, a week we, later. A week later. So hopefully you don't have big questions because I'll be in Minnesota. And your calendar it should say, I think, what, the 23rd? That Abigail sent you the board calendar? 24th. Okay, so terms for a vote to move this forward as presented. Top hold. Top hold. Yeah. Uh, I just show hands for anybody who supports the presentation. David, uh, I'll thank everyone online too. Anybody? Okay, that's the majority of Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Mary. Okay, next time we're going to the commissioner's report. Can you not turn the lights on? I can't read my own. It's perfect. Yeah. Save the group. Thank you. Save the group. Yeah, we know it's people come for. Yeah. Um, so I just have a few things I want to mention for everybody. Uh, one is uh, we have bears on the agenda tonight. Um, Jackie uh, and actually a number of folks um, in the agency outside of Fish and Wildlife as well have been working on bear conflicts, specifically around trying to find trash um, containers that are bear resistant. Uh, there's no such thing as bear proof. Um, we were told we met with one of the big haulers in the state. And they're actually beta testing solutions. And so um, we'll see how that works out. A lot of work going into that. We had over 1,500 conflicts last year. So it's a lot of work. So we're just involved. Along with Jackie, we're going out and trying to get it in. The uh, down at the state house, um, they're saying they're going to wrap it up uh, maybe around May 12th. Uh, let's see. The good news is our budget looks to be in good shape. Um, the the general fund ask is passed as requested, and the capital bill request. Saw a, sm a slight um, haircut, but some of that was put back in by institutions in the Senate side. Um, a lot of that money gets used for um, the fish culture stations, the maintenance that we need to do there. We're also looking at doing the roofs at Buck Lake. That money's in there. Um, and some other. Uh, money to allow us to continue to improve access in the WMAs um, and other properties. The money for the trap equipment upgrades stand. That was 400 or 400. That was yeah, that wasn't our ask. So Correct. I, I, I don't know. Curious to what. Um, you should all be aware that um, with regard to the Conti Refuge, um, you may know there was some issue around the 
the way they've been managing it, specifically doing uh, having to do with season for training of hounds in there. That public comment is being reopened um, by US Fish and Wildlife. We just notified, and that's going to open up in the next um, week or two, and I'll be open for 30 days for public comment. Um, specifics of that, I, I don't want to get into too much detail, um, but it has to do with they restricted the training um, based on interpretation of whether it would impact some migratory birds. Um, our position was not that, our position has not changed, and we will be articulating our position from them, and it will be the same. Just so you're aware, that is going on. Um, I'm traveling on Saturday down to Pennsylvania for the NEAFWA meeting, uh, the um, Northeast Regional Association of all um, other commissioners, directors from all the other states. But there also will be the regional director for the US Fish and Wildlife. She and I are going to have a meeting. Um, so if there's any issues you'd like me to bring, let me know. Um, and there are a number of people from the department traveling down, fish and wildlife biologists, uh, the colonel and the major are traveling as well. Fairly large event. If you look up the AFWA, Exactly how it sounds. N E A S W A. Uh, the uh, agenda for the entire meeting is up pretty extensive. It has a number of tracks. Um, and so I'll be down there for that. It's a quick hit down Saturday back Tuesday. And I think up in a minute, um, I don't have much else. Let's go ahead for any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions for the Commissioner? No, not seeing any. Okay, then I think that is it for the meeting tonight. Unless uh, there's anything else. Thanks. Seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? So made. Second. Second. All those in favor of adjourning, say by saying aye. 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 It's habits. Okay, Just thank you. Just a reminder that there is food. Oh, we got through this so quickly. I suggested to the chair that we don't stop to eat.